So this is the uh, third session dealing with the concept of innovation or topic of innovation or bid'ah in Islam. And in the last two topics or the last two sessions we've dealt in detail with about ten ayat from the Quran which censure or rebuke innovation. And last week we went through 17 hadith which rebuked or censured innovation in different ways. And I'd listed about 30 statements from the early scholars of Islam, uh, again rebuking the concept of innovation in Islam. And we went through some of those last week as well. Uh, so this week, inshallah, I intend to continue the session. And finally, today we'll actually come to a definition of what bid'ah is. So far in the previous sessions, we've just been talking about bid'ah as a general concept, quite a vague concept. Today, inshallah, we shall be discussing the uh, technical, detailed definition of the term innovation and going and exploring its meanings and going through it in detail as to what that definition really means. Um, just to point out as well that in the last two sessions, I've presented one point of view, the evidences for one point of view. And I haven't actually presented yet the evidences of the other point of view when it comes to regarding, <coughs> regarding bid'ah, which is uh, the, the, those who believe that you can in innovate new good things in Islam. And I'm getting loads of texts and loads of emails saying, Look, have you considered this evidence and why have you talked about this evidence and why have you talked about that? Inshallah, just be patient, it's all going to come. So just, just be patient. Inshallah, it'll probably come next week. The other side do have the evidences. They have evidences, they, share that they say that there's hadith that prove that there's bid'ah hasana. There are examples where the Sahaba did things that can only be regarded to be bid'ah hasna as they claim. There are statements from the Imams of the early, scholar, of the early scholars that talk about bid'ah hasna. And this is their claim, so inshallah we'll talk about them next week. And, and we will see next week as well that actually all the evidences they bring actually support our point of view. They actually, actually end up bolstering the point of view that innovation in deen, innovation in religion can only be of one type, which is blameworthy, which is to be censured. Inshallah, as I said, depending on how far we get today, we'll be covering all of that next week. So I want to summarize the last two sessions uh, that we've discussed by quoting the, the ayah of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ السَّمِي الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَدِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ That today I have perfected your religion for you completed my blessings upon you and I've chosen for you Islam as your religion. And I'm quoting this ayah again just to stress to us that this ayah is very clear that this religion, this beautiful deen that Allah has given us it is complete, it is perfect, it doesn't need any addition. And when we look, when we think about our religion, Islam and when we consider and ponder our religion of Islam we should be looking at it from this lens through, from this perspective, it is a complete, perfect religion. It doesn't need any addition, it doesn't need anything taken away from it. It is complete. Every law in this religion is perfect. Every law is complete. There is no contradiction, inconsistency in any of the ayat of the Qur'an, any of the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no contradiction, no mistake, no inconsistency. Everything is perfect. It has been preserved in its pristine form for us as a miracle by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no need to go for our religion to anything besides the words of Allah and the words of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to stress this point, we have these three hadith, which I didn't talk about last week. But again, all three of them are saying the same thing. That there is nothing that we require, that there is nothing that we require to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attain His good pleasure, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. There is nothing that will take us away from Allah, earn His displeasure, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. There is nothing that will take us closer to Paradise, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. There is nothing that will take us away from Hellfire, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. There is nothing that Allah has ordered us with, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. There is nothing that Allah has prohibited us from, except that Allah's Messenger has told us about it. This is what these three hadith are telling us. Very clearly, very explicitly. There is nothing that will take you closer to Allah except that I have ordered you with it. And nothing that will take you away from Allah except that I have forbidden you from it. There is nothing that will take you closer to paradise except that I have commanded you with it. And nothing that will take you closer to fire 
except that I have forbidden you from it. We have no need whatsoever of adding new things to make us draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adding new things to make us more deserving of paradise. In fact, by doing so, we are going against these statements of the Messenger والسلام, We are going against the completion and perfection of this religion. And again, another summary, I want to quote the statement of one of the great Imams, one of the great scholars of the Salaf, Awza'i. He said, Isbir nafsaka ala sunnah. وَقِفْ حَيْثُ وَقَفَ الْقَوْمِ وَقُلْ بِمَا قَالُوا وَكُفُّ عَمَّا كَفُّوا عَنْهُ وَاسْلُكْ سَبِيلَ سَلَفِكَ الصَّالِحِ فَإِنَّهُ يَسَأُكَ مَا وَسَعَهُمْ مَا وَسِعَهُمْ He said, patiently restrict yourself to the sunnah. Stick to that, that's all you need. Stop where the people stopped. He's talking about the salaf, the people who came before him, the sahaba. Stop where they stopped. What they didn't do, don't do. What they did, do, do, do that as well. Don't go beyond this. Avoid what they avoided. Take to the path of the Salaf because what was enough for them is surely enough for you. What was enough for them is surely enough for you. As Imam Malik would say, again, well, Imam Malik was very stringent against innovation. He said, what virtue can you hope to achieve in deen that these people have not already achieved? What virtue, what good thing could you hope to attain, to come up with something new? That these people have not already got in terms of their deen, in terms of religion. The Sahaba were the best of generations. Their students were the best of generations. The third generation were the best of generations. What virtue can we now, in the 14th century, expect to, att- expect to attain that they have not already attained? What new thing would we really want to do that they haven't already done? The we saw in the ayat in the last two weeks, two weeks ago, and the ahadith and the statements of the Salaf, that the condemnation of innovation, of bid'ah, is absolute. It's unqualified. It's absolute and unqualified. They, did, they didn't make any exceptions. And one of the, as I talked about last week, one of the things that really stresses the fact that they are meant to be absolute, unqualified, and general, without any exceptions, is the fact that Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, warned against innovation again and again and again throughout his entire life. So we saw, for example, the hadith uh, that وَشَرُ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا The worst of all matters are the newly invented matters. وَكُلُّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِرْعَ And every newly invented matter is an innovation. وَكُلُّ بِرْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every innovation is a misguidance. وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every misguidance is in the hellfire. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say this in his khutbahs every week. He would say this in the Eid khutbah, when he gave his nikah ceremonies, he would start the khutbah with this. Sometimes he started lectures with this statement, sometimes he answered questions with this statement. Throughout his entire life he kept on repeating this over and over and over again, this single statement. And never once did he say, you know what, there's exceptions. Don't, I'm not, I don't mean it in a general sense. Just understand that I'm only talking about a certain category of innovations. He never said this. And it shows us the Messenger of Allah's words are perfect when it comes to religion. He can't make a mistake when it comes to religion. So when he's repeating it again and again like this, he means it in that general sense. Not only does he repeat that same statement again and again and again, he pro- prohibits innovation in so many different ways again and again throughout his life. Directly and indirectly. And we saw all of the hadith in the previous weeks and all of the ayat in, the, in the various different ways that Allah's Messenger has prohibited innovation. And in all of these various different ways, that he's employed. Never once has he made an exception. Never once has he said there are some types of innovation that are okay for you to do. So we understand from these texts that the condemnation of innovation is absolute. Any innovation in deen, any innovation in religion is prohibited, unwarranted, not allowed. We find that the Salaf invariably, when they talked about bid'ah, they always talked about it in a negative sense. And there's one or two exceptions which we'll talk about next week, inshallah. And we find that the Maliki Imam, Ibn Zayd al-Qayrawani, he's one of the great Imams of the Maliki Matab. He said that the Maliki school, and he's one of the early Imams as well, very early Imams. He said the Maliki school, for example, they're all united on a condemnation of innovation. All of them, without exception, they all condemned innovation without exception. And as I said, bid'ah in its essence, is to deem something good in religion. 
that was not existing at the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa This is what bid'ah is in its essence. That you think something is good in religion, and that thing did not exist at the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we know that this goes against the completion of the deen and the perfection of the deen. We know that goodness and virtue in religion can only be determined, determined by revelation. Only wahi, only Allah and His Messenger can tell us what is good in deen and what is virtuous in deen and what is bad in deen as well. So for all of these reasons and other reasons, but these are the main ones, we understand that the condemnation of innovation is absolute. Okay. We've said the word bid'ah many times in, this, in these classes so far. What does it actually mean in the Arabic language? The word bid'ah. And it has two meanings. The first is to originate and to invent. To originate and to invent, to bring something into being for the first time. And it's in this sense that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قُلْ or Allah commands the Messenger of Allah to say, قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدَعًا مِنَ rusul. I am not a bid'ah amongst the messengers. I am not an innovation amongst the messengers, meaning I'm not something new. Messengers have come before me. I'm not a newly invented thing that never came before me. Many messengers, many prophets have come before me. I am not a bid'ah amongst the messengers. Likewise, to express the beauty and amazing, when you're amazed at something, they use the word bid'ah. This is an amazing thing. This is amazing. This is beautiful. And the sense is, that it's as if no one before them has managed to come up with something as beautiful as this. It's new in a sense of how perfect, how beautiful, how excellent it is. So it has this meaning of expressing amazement at, some, at the beauty and the novelty of something. And another meaning which is not linked here at all, to become fatigued or to break down or perish. This is the second meaning of the word bid'ah. So after the, mess- the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa there are many things that were innovated in the lexical sense of the word, in the linguistic sense of the word. There are many things that were innovated and were okay in this lexical sense of the word. So, for example, computers, cars, glasses, spectacles, etc., all of these things are innovations according to the linguistic sense of the word. They were not there, present at the time of the Messenger of Allah There's a point in time when they didn't exist and then they existed. They came out as something new. The technical definition of bid'ah. We've seen some definitions already in the past, in the statements of the past imams. Like the Sahabi Hudayfa. He, def- he said that every act of worship the companions did not do, do not do it. So his definition of innovation was doing an act of worship not done by the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Bukhari, for example, that statement we quoted last week, and he met 1,000 scholars. Or the 1,000 scholars he studied under, he said, I found all of them agreeing upon certain points. And he listed about 12, 15 points. And amongst them, he said, they all prohibited innovation. And then he defined innovation, that which the Prophet and his companions were not upon. That which the Prophet and his companions were not upon. 1,000 teachers of Bukhari, they were the greatest imams of their times. 1,000, he said. All of them with this definition of bid'ah. That which the Prophet and his companions were not upon. Where did they get this from? Which ayah did he quote to prove this? Who can remember? Which ayah did he quote to prove this? وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبَّ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا He said, and they quoted the ayah, Hold fast the rope of Allah, all of you, and don't split. And also they used the hadith about the 73 sects. My ummah will divide into 73 sects. All of them are in hellfire except for one. They asked, what is this one? He said, ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. What I and my companions are upon, or another narration, ma ana alayhi al wa ashabi. What I and my companions are upon today. So ma, what I and my companions are upon today, he defined that as being the way of the saved sect. The one that won't be going to hellfire. And that is how Imam Bukhari defines innovation. Anything that this group of people, a prophet and his companions were not upon. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, from the Hanbali school, another great imam. Whatever is newly invented, that is without a basis in the sharia, that substantiates it, that would prove it. And Ibn Hajar has a similar sort of def- definition from the Shafi school. 
But the one that we're going to be using, these are all the definitions that we've proceeded so far, these four or five definitions, they're all just talking about bid'ah at, at a very basic conceptual level. The technical, precise definition of innovation was provided by Imam al-Shatabid from the Maliki school. And he said, any invented act or path in the religion that resembles a sharia, the goal in following it is the same goal as following the sharia. Any inv invented act or path in the religion of Islam that resembles what's already there. It's not, like, it's not actually part of Islam, but it, makes people, it fools people into thinking that it's part of Islam. It's similar to what's already there. It's not alien. The goal in following it is the same goal as following the Sharia, i.e. attaining Allah's good pleasure, drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's this, def this definition that I want to drill down into and go into a lot of detail about actually what this definition really means. And understanding this definition will make us understand what innovation truly means as well. So this definition has got three main components. The first component is invention, something new. The second, be it general or specific. The second component is to be attributed to the religion. People make it to be part of the deen of Islam. The third component, which we talk about later on, it resembles the Sharia. It resembles the Sharia. So we'll talk about these, first, these two first of all. So it's invention. Why did I say invention? Because of the hadith we already talked about. Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. That whoever introduces, invents into this affair of ours, a matter that is not part of it, it must be rejected. And beware of newly invented matters. Wa iyakum wa sharul umuri muhtathatuha. And beware of newly invented matters for every innovation is uh, misguidance. Beware of newly invented matters because every innovation is misguidance. And this affair of ours, what is this affair of ours? When he talks about it in this hadith, what is this affair of ours? Yes. The deen of Islam. And we learn this by another narration in the Musnad of Ahmad, where the Messenger of Allah said, Man ahdatha fi deenina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. That whoever introduces into this deen of ours, this religion of ours, something that is not part of it, it must be rejected. So invention and attribution to the religion, we, we understand from these two, a hadith and other hadith and ayat as well. Now, the most important element of this definition is attribution to religion. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what is religion? What is deen? For us to understand how we attribute something to the deen of Islam. <clears throat> because normally we find people, whenever we talk about the censure of innovation, or that innovation is haram, it's not allowed, the first thing they'll ask you is, what about cards? What about computers? What about this mic? What about the, the mic that the Imam speaks through when he does a qira'ah in, in prayer? What about these sort of things? That's the first question they'll invariably ask. What about these sort of things? We're saying no, we're talking about deen. Introduction in the deen as a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said. So for us to talk about introduction into a deen, we must understand what deen is. We must understand what religion is. And in a nutshell, religion is everything that Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have legislated. Qala Allah, Qala Rasul. Allah said, the Messenger said. This is religion. There's nothing else besides this. Whether it be in, a, in an act of, they, they legislated an act of worship, or they legislated an act, an act of dunya in the world. Any area in which Allah's Messenger or Allah have legislated, that is deen for us. That is religion for us. And we can divide Islam and legislation, the Sharia, into two areas. Umur to Abudiya, which are ritualistic matters of worship, pure actions of worship, like the Salah, like the fasting, like the Hajj. And we can, divide, we can uh, 
divide it into Amur Adiyah or Umur Adiyah. Matters that are non-ritualistic or mundane matters. For example, and they de these deal with how people interact with each other really. Mu'amalat. How we interact with ourselves, how we interact with creation. I.e. everything but our interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, for example, in examples of this would be marriage, buying and selling, eating and drinking. These are umur adiyah. The Sharia has actually legislated in both. Mainly it's legislated in umur ta'abudiyah, ritualistic actions of worship. And mainly it has left the umur adiyah open, mainly speaking. But these are the two general categories of the Sharia. Ritualistic acts of worship, non-ritualistic acts as well, or mundane matters. We're going to drill further into the first, both of these categories. When we talk about umur ta'abudiyya, acts of worship, like we said, salah, fasting and hajj. These we say are called ta'abudiyya, the acts of worship. Why? Because we don't really, we can't really rationalize the reason behind these acts. Besides the fact that they're an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't really understand the reason behind these acts. Why is Asr prayer four rak'ahs? Why is Maghrib prayer three rak'ahs? Why is there a ruku and after ruku comes sujood? Or why is there standing and then ruku and then sujood in that order in the prayer? Why is the prayer de defined by beginning time and the end time? Why, why, why? We don't, we don't have answers to this. For us in these areas, it's just submission. And all we need to know is that these are acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this, in this realm, umur ta'abudiyya, ritualistic matters, mankind has no role to play whatsoever. We have no role in these matters whatsoever to play. It is entirely Allah said, Allah's Messenger said. Only Allah can tell us how to worship Him. Only Allah's Messenger can tell us how to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you add to this field, it's an innovation. If you take away from this field, it's an innovation. If you add a sixth prayer in Islam, it's an innovation. If you make it four prayers instead of five, it's an innovation. To add and to take away is an innovation. And generally speaking, qiyas or analogy doesn't apply. What this means is that we can't, because we don't know the reason behind the ruling, we can't make an analogy. We can't say, okay, because this is a reason here, we can also apply that reason to somewhere else as well. Is that clear? Am I making sense? So, umur ta'abudi, ritualistic actions of worship. Anybody confused? So the main point about these is that these are pure acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're predominantly defined by the fact that we don't know the whys behind them. We don't know why they are in that particular format. Why is zakat with all the rules and regulations like it, exactly like that? Why is the salah and the hajj and the psalm exactly in the format that it is? Beyond the fact that it's an act of worship, we have no understanding of why. We can derive some wisdom, there's a wisdom in this and a wisdom in this, but the actual core reason, Allah said, Allah's Messenger said. <coughs> Acts of worship have two categories. They call it ibadat mutlaqa and ibadat muqayyada. Acts of worship that are unqualified. <laughs> unqualified acts of worship. And these are ibadat that Allah has said and given us flexibility in. And he's left them open. So we have room in these to perform lots or to perform little. And in this category, there's enough there without, having, without us having to innovate new things. So for example, examples of ibadat mutlaqa, unqualified acts of worship. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do dhikr any time, as much as you want. Dhikr of Allah any time, as much as you want. Reading of Quran, any time, as much as you want. Nafil prayers and fasts, nafil, nafil fasts, as many as you want, so, and nafil prayers, as many as you want, so long as they're not in the three prohibited times. Being good to parents, Allah has commanded us as an act of worship to be good to our parents, but he hasn't said you, can, you, you have to be good to them in, X, in this way, X, Y, and Z. He's left it open to show us that there are many, many ways of being good to our parents, and Allah wants us to be good to our parents in all of these ways. Not just one or two of them, but all of these ways. These are unqualified acts of worship. But even in these unqualified acts of worship, we can't make a, give them or assign to them a specific aspect. So for example, 
We know that a Nafil fast on the day of Arafah, the status of that fast is higher than other Nafil fasts. But we can't then decide, okay, you know what? A Nafil fast on Tuesday is also of a higher status. Or a Nafil fast on my birthday is also a higher status. We can't make those decisions. Yeah, because then you're introducing some new aspect to these Nafil fasts. So as long as we keep them open, that's fine. As long as we don't add specific uh, qualities to these, to these acts. So the point being, in, the, in this category of ibadat, ibadat mutlaqa, there's a large degree of flexibility in them. And then we have the second category of ibadat, which is... Okay, ibadat muqayyada, qualified acts of worship. And these are where the legislator, Allah or his messenger, have put specific parameters in place. So, for example, be good to your parents, no, no real parameters there, apart from general principles. Muqayyada, like the salah, the specific parameters. There's a start time, there's an end time. You have to meet conditions, you have to be facing the qibla, you have to have intention, you have to have wudu, you have to have, you know, so many different things. Allah has put conditions and put barriers and boundaries around these acts of worship. Showing us that Allah wants something different from us in this category that He wanted from that category. He wants something different from us. In that first category, He wants us just to do open acts of worship. Here, He wants us to do acts of worship in a very specific, very precise way. He wants us to do it in that way, not to step outside of that way. And to step outside of that way is an innovation. To, to go against what Allah's Messenger or Allah's legislated. There can be no alteration in these types of worship at all. So for example, the, the two rakahs of before Fajr, I can't decide to make them four rakahs. I can't decide to pray them after Fajr, uh, for no valid reason. Five daily prayers, I can't make them six daily prayers. I can't make Maghrib with four rakahs in Salah. I can't, make, I can't do that. I can't make Fajr with two rakahs, or three rakahs in Salah. I can't do that. The zakat has got specific rulings. I can't change these at all. And it's a departure from these principles in both the mutlaqa and the muqayyida, the unrestricted and the qualified. That leads to innovation. So for example, <coughs> people start using general texts to prove specific practices in Islam. And this is, a, this is not allowed. You can't use a general text to justify a specific practice. For example, uh, we quoted a hadith two weeks ago where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a man standing in the sun without any shade and he asked about this person and he was replied this man has taken an oath he has made an oath by Allah to stand and not to sit and not to take any shade and to fast and in some narrations it's mentioned that he was doing this on the day of, on the day of Jumaa, while the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was delivering the khutbah. This is an innovation. What this person has done is he's taken different parts of the Sharia, which are proven by general texts, bolted them all together, and come up with a new action of worship. So what's he done? He said he said, for example. I want to honor and respect the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is something proven by the Sharia. Nobody doubts this. So I'm going to stand during his khutbah. I'm going to stand during his khutbah. Standing is an act of worship in some places, like in the Salah. Therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to, that's another justification for me standing during the khutbah. Not standing, standing in the open without any protection from the sun, can be an act of worship, for, the, for example, in pilgrimage. When a person, the pilgrim, does his acts of worship and, he's, and, he, and he can't avoid the sun, he actually gets extra reward for that, for, for having, bearing the difficulty of the heat of the sun. So he's thinking, okay, you know what, I'll add this as well. I'm not going to sit in the shade. Again, it's proven in one place, but he's put it in this place. So he's taking these different justifications. All of them are valid justifications in their correct place. And he's come together with a new form of, act, of, form of worship. And he's saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to stand in respect of the khutbah of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, without taking, seeking any shade. The Messenger of Allah, I'm going to fast as well. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited him from all of this. Sit down, take the shade, drink some water, but fulfill your oath to fast. Out of all those things that he did, the only thing that was valid is if you make an oath to fast, you have to fulfill it. This is exactly how innovation comes about. It's you're taking these general texts, these general things in the Sharia, and you're making a specific act of worship out of them. This is how innovation comes about. So to avoid this, when we're doing our nafil prayers, when we're doing our extra acts of worship, when we're doing our dhikr, when we're doing our salah, the durood upon the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, we want to avoid any form of specification that makes it extra special in our eyes. So for example, specifying a particular day or night for a nafil prayer, to utter a set dhikr in morning and evening, to specify a certain amount of Qur'an to recite per day, all of this is okay if I don't think there's anything special about that portion of Qur'an I'm reciting or anything special about those dhikrs that I'm doing that are beyond what's already been taught to us by Allah's Messenger. So for example, if it's because of the fact I have night shifts and the only night shift I don't have is on Tuesday and I decide to do Tahajjud prayer every Tuesday at night, no problem with this whatsoever. Even though I'm doing it every Tuesday night and I'm particularizing that day because but I'm not doing it for any specific special reason for Tuesday night. I'm just saying it's because I've got a day off on that day. That's my only reason. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But for me to believe that Tuesday night to Hajjud is extra special, is extra reward, and it makes me draw even closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes an innovation. Is that clear? Do we understand? Yeah. So we don't want to use a general text to prove specific acts. Yes? Does that task specify certain amount or a specific portion? For yeah. example, if I say every day five ayahs, yeah. There's no problem. No, so these are examples that are all okay. Yeah. So if I want to specify for myself every day, I'm going to recite five ayat of the Quran. No problem with that whatsoever. Because that's just, you know, I've just decided that for me, that's the best thing to do. I can concentrate on them better. It's enough portion for me. Somebody else might decide half a juz, for example, or a juz. But I've decided five. I don't believe there's anything special about five or anything special about half a juz. I don't believe anything like that. I'm just, that's, what, that's just what suits me. Absolutely fine. Even if I do it every single day without fail. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. No problem with that whatsoever. So those are the umur ta'abudiyya. Is there anything that brothers are not to tear about in terms of ritualistic acts of worship? This is part of what the deen is. Ritualistic acts of worship. <clears throat> okay. Second part where deen, what Allah and his messenger have legislated. But in this second part, they've only given very few legislation. There's only very little legislation. And it's generally dealt with in terms of general principles. So, for example, a general principle that we deal with when we come to umur uh, adiyya or dunya, we things, worldly things. Don't oppress each other. A general principle. La darar wa la dirar. Don't harm each other. Again, a general principle. Wa la ta'kulu amwala kum baynakum bil batil. Don't consume each other's property and wealth in falsehood, unjustly. Again, a general principle. So in these things, generally speaking, we just have general principles that we apply when we try to come up with new things or when new things happen. So umur adiyya, non-ritualistic matters. Example, marriage, buying and selling, eating and drinking. And the difference between these and worship is that here we generally understand the why behind we're doing, why we're doing things. We understand the why. Why do we have to buy and sell? We understand why we have to buy and sell. Why do we have to act as a society? We understand that. Why do we have to get married? We understand why we get married, etc. We understand the whys behind these things. And innovation in these things is not necessarily bad. It only becomes a bit in a bad sense of the word when they are taken as religion or we introduce things where Allah and His Messenger have already spoken about in that particular area. So for example, marriage and divorce. We have some rules and regulations about marriage and divorce given to us by Allah and His Messenger To introduce new things in those rules and regulations would be an innovation, even though it's a worldly matter. Why? Because Allah and His Messenger have legislated there. So for example, at talaq bid'i. An innovation, div innovated divorce. What is that? It's when a person divorces his wife when she's in menstruation. 
We're not, it goes against the Sharia. It's not, we're, not, we're not allowed to divorce women while they're in menstruation. So this is a form of an innovated form of di- divorce. When you try to divorce her when she's actually men- menstruating. So in these areas, innovation can come about. But, be, besides, where Allah, besides those specific areas where Allah's messenger have legislated, everything else is open. So how do we celebrate marriage? The way of celebrating a nikah is entirely open. So long as you adhere to the general principles of Islam, how Pakistanis would celebrate it is different from the way Arabs celebrate it, it's different from the way the English celebrate it, it's different from the way the Indians celebrate it. All the differences are fine, no problem with it whatsoever. Because Allah has not legislated in this area. It's open. And this is why you find, and it's a very important point, that the Sahaba, when they spread, when Islam spread to different areas, diff, uh, took over different countries, they didn't, oppo- they didn't impose Arab culture on those countries. They didn't impose Arab customs on those countries. They left their cultures, they left their customs as they were. Except for those areas that specifically contradicted Islam. Very important, dress sense. They left it, they didn't impose Arab dress sense on non-Arabs. They didn't do this. They didn't impose a hat or, a, or, a, or, a, uh, or even a, th- a, a qamis, a thobe. They didn't impose that on other, other non-Arab people. They left it to their, they left it to their own customs, to their own, to their own cultures. As I said, the only way something in this really becomes an innovation is when you start doing things either in a way that Allah has, in in those areas that Allah has legislated like the marriage and divorce contract or by believing things to be a way of drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, a type of food. I could leave a type of food either for a medical reason, either because I don't like that food or I believe that me leaving that type of food draws me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In which case it becomes an innovation. Others is fine. Leaving it because I don't like it is fine. Uh, leaving it because of medical reasons is fine. But leaving it because I think it draws me closer to Allah by leaving you know, a, a, a banana or eating a banana or whatever, that becomes an innovation. Yes? What's the question? Yeah. Yeah, so to do it in a particular way, like the Arabs did it back at that time, to do it believing that is the religious way of doing it, and that's the only correct way and deemed to do it, I mean, the way of celebrating we're talking about, not the contract itself, which is legislated, then yes, that is a form of innovation. But to do it, for example, you, to do it because you say, you know what, the Messenger of Allah did it, even celebrated in this particular way. And I don't believe that celebrating it in this particular way is a sunnah, because I want to be like the Messenger of Allah as much as possible, I'm going to do it in this particular way, for me personally. Not for other people, for me personally. That's for that love of the Messenger, because of my love of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that's actually a rewarding act. Yeah. He's not imposing it upon anybody else. He's not saying you have to do it this way. He's saying for me personally, I want to follow the Messenger of Allah as much as possible, even in those things that he didn't legislate as sunnah. And in, uh, the, that's allowed for me to do as a personal, as a personal preference. I get rewarded for that, inshallah, for my love of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. But for me to then say that is the only way of celebrating a marriage, this is not allowed. Can we pass a slightly different way? Yeah. Like, what about something like furniture? At the time, they didn't have sofas and everything. So now we've got people who say, right, oh, we shouldn't have furniture and sit on the floor. I've just answered that, have I not? Yeah, yeah so, you have. But yeah. Is that the same thing then? Because do they believe that they get extra rewarded for that? For so not having that furniture? If they follow that custom of that time, no, no. If they believe they got an extra reward for following that particular custom, then it's an innovation. Okay. Um, but as I said, if they're doing it because they want to love the, the love of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and they're trying to do imitate it as much as possible, they get rewarded for that love, not for the custom. That custom is just a custom; it doesn't really mean much. They get rewarded for that love of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and their desire to be as much like him as possible. Is that? Am I making sense? Any other questions? What time is this show today? Okay, so Umur Adiya, non ritualistic matters. All of them are okay. 
so long as you do the deeds, not believing that they are an act of worship. Number two, they don't involve imitation of the kuffar. Okay. What does imitation of a kuffar mean? This is something very misunderstood amongst people. Imitation of a kuffar isn't really in wearing jeans and wearing a t-shirt, as opposed to wearing a thobe and wearing a, a, a gutra or whatever. Imitation of a kuffar is imitating in the, them in those spe specific things that define the kafir as being a kafir, that make them a kafir. Yeah, it's, not, it's basically imitation in things that are unique to them, that really define them as being them. So for example, the priest's robes. What they, there's a name for them, right? The, those priest robes, right? That is actually, that dress is actually a dress that defines, it's actually very much a definition of a kafir, that particular dress. Okay, but jeans and t-shirt are not, there's nothing wrong, wrong with that whatsoever, okay? That's, that's a, so long as we fulfill general principles of the sharia, they're being not transparent, they're being loose, etc., etc., but the garments are fine. Uh, wearing a cross, for example, it's a, it's, in that case, it's a religious symbol as well. Anything that's really specific to the kafir, that defines, that kafir, defines, them, defines them as being a kafir, that's what we mean here. So it's not anything that the kuffar do that we're not allowed to do. It's anything that the kuffar do that's really unique to them and defines them as being them. Okay, is that, am I making sense? Okay? Like people start asking, oh, what about fish and chips? You know, it's like, the silly question. You know, Muslims never had fish and chips. Fish and chips don't define a kafir as a kafir. Right? It doesn't make a kafir a kafir of fish and chips. Yeah, and other things, mundane things like this, it doesn't, these sort of things, that's not what we mean, we mean when we say imitation of kuffar. And thirdly, they don't violate any principles of a sharia. You're not, you're not being unjust. You're not eating people's property, you're consuming property, people's property. Uh, uh, unlawfully, you're not harming other people, you're not violating general principles of the Sharia. So, Umur Adiyah, um, in this area, as I said, there's only very few areas where Allah and His Messenger have legislated. Most of it they left open. And we're allowed to do anything in the Umur Adiyah uh, category so long as we don't violate these three principles. Clear? And this is what deen is. This is what deen is. Ta'budiyya, adiyya. Both of those together. Deen, ta'budiyya completely, definitely 100% part of deen. Adiyya, the non-ritualistic acts of worship, only those areas of it that Allah and His Messenger have specifically legislated in is part of deen. Everything else is not part of deen. So, has Allah, has Allah legislated about cause? No. So it's not part of deen. Has Allah legislated about how to manufacture this table? No. So long as it's not harming somebody else, so long as it's not consuming people's property unlawfully, etc., etc., those principles are being met, there's no, there's no legislation. Has Allah legislated about mics? The answer is no. Has Allah legislated about tablets? The answer is no. All of this is okay because there's no legislation there. Allah has left it open. Allah is not forgetful. He didn't leave it open while well, he has out of forgetfulness. He left it open as a mercy to us. Because he knows that this is how dunya, how the life, the only way life can proceed easily for people is if these matters are left open for us. Otherwise, it becomes very, very difficult for us to live life. Also, when we talk about sunnah, again, we're still defining what deen is. Sunnah is actually of two categories. One category we all know. One category many of us are not really aware of. Sunnah fi'aliyyah. Sunnah Tarkiya. Sunnah can be things that the Messenger of Allah did and things that the Messenger of Allah left. He didn't do. Things that he did, we all know. We, we all know things that he did. The Salah, the, the, the Qiyam, or, or Layl, Tarawih prayer, all of these, we know the Sunnah, the things that he did. But the things that he left والسلام, are of two types. Those things that he explicitly said, I've left. Or well, the Sahaba explicitly said he's left. For example, he didn't do the ghusl of the shuhada of Uhud. Normally we do a ghusl of, of, of the dead people. For the people, martyrs of Uhud, he didn't do the ghusl. He didn't do adhan and niqama for the Eid prayer. He didn't do tasbih between salahs when he joined them. When he joined Zuhur and Asr prayer, for example, he didn't, didn't do the tasbih between them. He did tasbih at the end of both of them. So in these things, the sunnah is not to do the adhan and iqamah for the Eid prayer. And to do it is an innovation. 
And we can't argue, you know what? Adhan is an act of dhikr. And Allah has commanded us to do dhikr as much as we can. And why can't we then? I can decide to do dhikr before the Eid prayer. No, because the Messenger of Allah specifically left it out on this occasion. You can't argue with a general text to prove a specific point, especially when the Messenger of Allah has left it explicitly. Why can't I do the tasbih between the two salahs? The Messenger of Allah didn't do it. That's all we need to know. He didn't do it. You can't argue always dhikr. Why are you preventing me from doing dhikr? In this occasion, the Messenger of Allah specifically did not do it. He said, I'm not doing it. He left it to the end. This is a sunnah. This is how we follow the sunnah. The other category, and this is a very important category to understand. Things that the Messenger of Allah left. And there's no explicit mention that he left them. But these things... There was nothing preventing him from doing those acts. There was nothing preventing him from doing those acts. We could say the Messenger of Allah وسلم, could not possibly have driven a car. Why? Because cars did not exist at his time. Okay? But there are things that the Messenger of Allah could have done without ever not doing them, without during his lifetime, but he did not do. Even though there was reason, the reasons were there to do them as well. For example, did he ever speak the niyyah before the salah? As we normally say, yeah. Did he ever do this? Is there anything stopping him from doing this? Like a car, the car wasn't existing. Is there anything that pre- preventing him from saying that niyyah before the salah? No. Therefore, we say that has to be left as well. Make, not making congregational dua after the salah. After Dhuhr Asr prayer, did he raise his hands? Did everybody raise their hands together and say, I mean, after he made dua? No, never, he never did this. Is there anything stopping him from doing this? No. Therefore, he left it for a reason. It's enough for us to know that he left it, that we should leave it as well. <coughs> and all of these other things I mentioned, like not making Qunud prayer in the second rakah of Fajr, not doing the salah upon the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, in the ruku and the sujood of the prayer. We know that doing salah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, is a great act of worship. But we can't do it in the ruku and the salah, in the sujood, in the prayer, because the Messenger of Allah never did it. It's not explicitly mentioned, but if he had done it, it would have been narrated to us. And it's not been narrated to us. Uh, not reciting Quran in the graveyards. The Messenger of Allah, the Sahaba, so many people passed away during his lifetime. So many people have made shaheed after, uh, as well. Never once did he go to the graveyards. Open up a mushaf, they didn't have a mushaf then. Never go to graveyards and start reciting Quran. Reciting Yasin, he never did this. Was there anything stopping him from doing so? No. If he had done it, it would have been reported to us, it's not been reported to us. Therefore, it's enough for us to know that, it's, that he did not do it. The khatams after people have passed away. You know, in, our, in the Asian uh, Pakistani traditions, Indian tra- traditions, after people pass away, you know, 40th day, X number of days, they do khatams. So many people passed away during the time of the Messenger, alayhi salatu so many people passed away during the time of the Sahaba. Did they ever do a khatam? No. Is anything stopping them from doing a khatam? No. It's not been reported to us that they did it. It's enough, therefore, that they did not do it. So sunnah tarqiyah, the things that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa left are also sunnah for us to leave. And to introduce things that he left is an innovation. To introduce things into deen that he left is an innovation. Um, is that clear? Uh, okay, then. we'll have time to finish this. There's quite a lot more to go, actually. So. Okay, so the last thing, let's just try to finish this in the last five minutes. The third component, so intro, we talked about bid'ah, and the de- technical definition is number one, invention. Number two, attributing it to the deen. Number three, imitation of the sharia. It's something that resembles the sharia. Uh, you're giving, you're introducing something into Islam and you're giving that act particular characteristics that you find that the Sharia normally assigns acts of worship. Like time, place, number, manner or cause. Or you're giving either acts of worship or mundane acts these characteristics. That's the Hajjid prayer on the 17th of Rajab. Because he believes it's a night of the Isra. That's because he's celebrating that occasion as a cause. This is a cause. The Sharia has given causes that you can, you can celebrate the, the acts of worship for. This is not one of them. But it resembles it. 
a cause, celebrating it because it's a night of the Isra, species or jinns, the category. Worshipping Allah by sacrificing a horse. We only have to sacrifice certain types of animals. This person introduces a new type of animal in the jinns, a horse. Becomes an innovation. Quantity. He decides to pray Maghrib prayers, four rakahs instead of three rakahs. The Sharia has already assigned quantities of certain things. He decides to give new quantities to them or to add something new that's got separate quantities. So he decides to pray Maghrib as four rakahs or does tawaf with eight, with eight circuits instead of seven. Manam, the hayah of doing an act of worship. He changes the order of wudu, for example. Or he does tawaf in the opposite direction. Assigning specific times for these acts. A person he wants to sacrifice an animal on the 15th of every month, thinking there's a special significance to the 15th of that month. Avoiding marriages in Shawwal, it's a very common pattern in Pakistan and India. Avoiding marriage in Shawwal because, because of that occasion. Place, Makan, assigning a, a specific place to that act. So performing itikaf, but not in a masjid, forms it in a community centre, for example. So you are, in all of these things, you are imitating the Sharia because you're introducing an act and giving it a form or a characteristic which is only for the Sharia to give. It's only for Allah and His Messenger to give. So you're giving it a cause, a suburb. You're giving it a species, a, a, a jinns. You're assigning it a, a, a number, a, 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 a specific number. You're giving it a particular mannerism, a hayah. You're assigning it a specific time to do it. You're giving it a specific place to give, give to do it in, believing there's special significance to all of these things. So this is how something introduced that's new in Islam that can imitate the Sharia. Am I confusing people? Does that make sense? Okay. So bid and religion can only be bad. It can happen in sayings. Like for example, saying in, in Niyyah before the Salah, in deeds, introducing new acts of worship and prayers, Turuq omissions, doing things that the Messenger of Allah did, didn't do, when he could have done them, and Aqa'id, beliefs, innovative beliefs. All of these areas, you can introduce innovations to. Okay. And just to, again, go back to this definition. Any invented act or path in the religion that resembles the Sharia, the goal in following it is the same goal as following the religion, as following the Sharia. So we've talked about in that definition the act of invention. We talked about deen, religion. What does religion really mean? What does it mean to when we say invent in the religion of Islam? What does it mean to say resembles the Sharia? What does that mean? And the goal in following it is the same goal as following the Sharia. I.e., you want to draw closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay, we're going to stop there for the other inshallah.